if everyone wants to get a seat. I know this is our first meeting in person since, what, 2019, since before COVID. So it's really fun to all be together and see each other and be back in our um, same meeting place. So welcome and thank you for coming. And Steve Hansen, thank you for live streaming it. We are live on Facebook and our YouTube channel. So I just want to welcome you all here. And this is our annual meeting, um, 2022. And I just want to take a second. Um, and by the way, you all know me, Anne Marie McClellan. I'm one of the co-presidents along with Ellen Oaks here, um, our other co-president. And just take a second to look at all the accomplishments we've had in this last year. We, we're a busy, we're a small group, but a busy group. And one of the things is that we're celebrating is our new updated website, the Club Express, has been active for one year. And it's very nice for uh, the public, but it's also super nice for board members and um, other members of our league. We can store all our documents there. So there's a lot that happens behind the scenes there on that Club Express, and it's really helped uh, us organize ourselves. We're in good fiscal shape. We've had uh, two forums. We had the Menominee School Board Forum with 250 viewers, so that's a nice impact. And our other forum, we just consulted um, with Stout students who wanted to have a forum for the third um, CD candidates. It's a little early because the primary is not ready, so uh, we mainly work with them as an advisory group to let them know how to run um, a forum. We've had six voter service um, drives with um, touching 324 people with our wonderful voter service group. They've gone in and registered um, people that are in the jail. They've reached out to high schools and college students. We've also managed to squeeze in two celebrations this year. Our um, December holiday social we had with a silent auction for the first time, which was a successful fundraiser for us. And then we also had the performance Failure is Impossible, where we collaborated with the women in theater in Eau Claire. And that was a lot of fun. We had 100 people there in attendance. Um, we've had seven different educational forums on topics that included local elections, water protection, and several focusing on diversity and immigration experiences. Our membership group organized Books and Beyond, and they've had seven discussion sessions. Um, and we were invited to participate in activities both with uh, UW Stout and UW Eau Claire groups. <laughs> and we all rallied for fair maps. Um, and I want to encourage you all to continue to check your the newsletter, The Citizen, that is put out um, with Joan and Pat. Um, being responsible for getting it out. In this latest issue, if you click on a link, you can see where your district is and see if your district bounds have changed. Some of them have changed um, up to the north and around Eau Claire. So use that link, nose around, see what district you're in, and, and see how things have changed um, for us this year. And then lastly, I just want to offer many, many thanks to all the hardworking leaguers that are out here um, doing lead work almost every day, and uh, it's a delight to work with all of you. So now I'm going to officially call this meeting to order. And we have had the uh, minutes from our prior annual meeting, which was May 25th, 2021, that were sent to all members prior to this meeting. Are there any um, changes or edits to those minutes? No, anyone want to make a motion to accept the minutes as distributed? Oh, we can do it by consensus. Oh, we can do it by consensus. Any objections? No. Also, the um, year-to-date um, treasurer's annual report was sent prior to the meeting. Um, any, do we accept that by consensus? Any issues with that? Okay, then um, as far as our voting, everyone, all the members were sent a ballot on April 26th to vote to ensure that we had um, a quorum of 29 members uh, voting for uh, our board and the budget. 
in the budget for 2022-23 was unanimously approved by um, all voters. And then um, we had our board elections and we want to thank our outgoing board members. Um, one, Mary Lawton, who is not here, she is was the webmaster and, and a founding um, board member from the very beginning. The whole design and inception of the website was hers. So she has just been um, key to getting ourselves organized and she is not able to be here and she has stepped off um, the board and has um, relinquished her responsibilities to the website to Joan Custer. We thank you very much for all your work that you're doing there. And also we thank Louisa for being um, a co-VP. She stepped down after this um, year too. She served for three years, which was through our COVID and um, being still in the working world and being a busy lady, she knew all the ins and outs of Zoom and how to pivot and start doing all our meetings um, on, you know, online instead of here. So we thank you very much for all your insight and all your leadership in, uh, as a co-VP. So our elections this year, um, Ellen Oaks was up for um, co-president and she was voted in again for another two year term unanimously. So we are very grateful that you stepped up for another two year term. Um, in particular, I am very grateful. <laughs> uh, we work well and I'd say any organization, if you wanna have a co-president or co-leaders, that is the way to go. It has been, uh, it's a pleasure and it lowers the burden of being in a leadership role. And then we also had um, a position for co-treasurer as Joan um, is the treasurer and now has moved over to managing the website. She's been doing both. So we um, had an election for a co-treasurer. So this is our first time having a co-treasurer, which is nice so that she, they, they can trade off roles um, and Joan can be there to guide Donna Weedman, who was elected as our co-treasurer. And Donna is, off in Norway, I think, in Europe. We have all these people scooting around Europe these days. <laughs> so um, congratulations. And then we had a position for a co-VP um, that was not filled. Um, and so we don't have a quorum here to take nominations from the floor, but um, we are super pleased, the board is super pleased that Steve Hansen has agreed to take on this role. And by our bylaws, um, we can go ahead and appoint him for a year to take on that role. And we thank you very much. So, well, I mean, you know, I so, that's really great. Um, and one last thing before we move on to our um, speaker is our upcoming events. Um, the voter registration and membership outreach is doing a program with the Academy of Lifelong Learners on June 7th. Uh, the League of Women Voters Wisconsin annual meeting in Appleton is the first time in person um, in the last couple of years. It's been all virtual. Um, and you can join virtually if you want. That's June um, 10th and 11th. And all these events are on our our website, if you go to the calendar, that's a really great resource. It'll give you all the links that you need to find further information. We're glad to have our program um, planning meeting on June 16th that will be outdoors um, in Ellen Oaks's yard. We've done this for the last couple of years and it works really well and we encourage all members to show up. It's not just a board thing. And what we'll do is decide on the programming for um, this coming year. And as you recall, our years, that goes on a fiscal year from July to June. Um, we also have a Women's Equality Day on August 26th, and we need good ideas on how to celebrate that. So we're welcoming all members' suggestions. And of course, we'll be doing lots of candidate forums um, this fall with all the assembly people up for election. So that's kind of preview of coming attractions. So now I want to turn um, it over to our speaker, Isak Mohammed, um, who's going to talk to us. It's 
title from Somalia to Barron City Council, how I got there, and what a journey that is, right? I mean, we're, it's so, we're honored to have someone who is a city council member come and talk to us about what it's like, what it's like to run for election. I mean, know this was not your first shot at it, so you've been endured, and now you're on the council, and it's... Um, your immigration experience, you know, it's a lot, something that not very many people can step up and have, perform that sort of service for their community. So we're really um, happy to have you here, Isak, and if you want to just come up and um, talk to us, uh, we'll be pleased to hear you. Hello all, uh, good evening. My name is Isaac Mohamed. Uh, I live in Bay, Wisconsin. It's uh, my home. This is the home I have. I'm a father of five children. Four of my children were born in Bay, and uh, my oldest one you know, uh, came with, his, with my wife uh, from Africa. But I have five children right now. Uh, I am a Somali district liaison for Baron Area School District, a community liaison officer uh, with Baron Police Department, uh, the recent most uh, elected uh, Baron City Council. So I was recently elected uh, uh, City of Baron for District 3. So uh, my story is long and my journey is long. I was born and raised in Somalia. I was a refugee, not that I chose to be a refugee, but I was forced to leave my homeland and uh, I was seeking asylum for a neighboring country called East African country called uh, Uganda. So after I left my hometown and uh, fled to the neighboring nations of East Africa, Uganda, I was a refugee uh, in Uganda since from 27 until 20, June, until June 4th. Then June 4th is when I left and came to US June 5th. As you know, the travel text from US to Africa probably more than 24 days, you know. So I was a refugee, had no choice. I don't want to say this, but it is, you know, it's, it's not, life's not easy to live in a refugee camp. I started in the refugee camp, you know, uh, you know, living in another nation where people speak another language. It's always tough. So my experience in life began from Uganda. I graduated the University of St. Lawrence in Kambala, Uganda. And then while I was in uh, schooling, I started working with the UNICR. The UNICR is the UN Refugee Agency. So, I started working with the UN and then ended up working with US refugee admission program for refugee processing uh, cases as an interpreter and uh, transfer for the US admission of refugee uh, uh, assistance. I've also worked with the Swedish embassy. I wor I've worked with uh, the international organization called IOM. It is designed for a movement uh, from refugees from one place to another place. So, you know, living in refugee camp is not easy. Uh, you know, life is very hard where you don't have many choices. Mm -hmm. There's no good health care. Uh, you know, not proper, you know, good shelter. There's no good shelter or good homes. You know, no health care, you know, no enough food. So, after living there and surviving, I was able to accomplish my life, went to school, you know, uh, the school was not like, you know, proper form of education, but at least I was able to go. School is on and off. I went to primary education, went to the high school, and then ended up, you know, uh, to the you know, uh, university. Not everything is smooth as, you know, uh, you know, as developed nation that we live today in the U.S., but I was able to make it, you know, until uh, the university level, and I was able to graduate, and uh, I was able to obtain a social worker of, a uh, bachelor degree of social worker. And then I came to US. Uh, it was June 5th when I came to US. Uh, I landed in Albuquerque City in New Mexico. I asked uh, one of my colleagues with the UN and said, 
I hope I can go a uh, place where there's no snow. <laughs> <laughs> so I was lucky enough, I was chosen to be resettled uh, in, uh, in uh, New Mexico. And you know, just briefly to talk about refugee. You know, people think when they say that, oh, you're a refugee, you come from another nation. It's not like a day or two, it's not like a dream, it's not like a quick thing that you get one day, two days. It is a long process where people suffer. You have to, you will have to do multiple interviews. It's called phase one, phase two, phase three. The last one is being done by Homeland Security, the DHS, uh, the USCIS, the US, United States Citizenship and Immigration. They are the ones to decide whether you, are, you, you, you go to US or not. So your process begins from the UN. I was interviewed by United Nations, and then next, after the UN, US had interviewed me three times, I was, my case was transferred to US refugee agency, which is the Church World Services uh, refugee agencies. And then I was interviewed again three to four times. And then my case was forwarded to the Homeland Security, the US Citizenship and Immigration. That's where the final, whether you are, you will be accepted or rejected. If you are consistent and you are telling the truth, you will pass the interview. That means you will have to memorize from A to Z, which is not easy for everyone. Most of our, you know, people have, you know, who are not, most of our people who have not gone to school or have not had a chance to be in a school because of, you know, living in a civil war uh, country, Somalia, I mean, some of the people were not able to memorize on that interview. But the good luck, the UNHCR and the US Refugee Program are very kind people who will still, you know, uh, help people, uh, guide them. They have interpreters, they have translators who will guide and, you know, uh, help translate whatever has been said to the uh, to USCIS <coughs> officials. So after all that process, you know, you are approved by the USCIS. It doesn't mean after you do the interview, you, you, you board the plane, again, you will be sent investigation again. You will be sent to USCIS, uh, will send your case back to the US for administration processing, where the FBI and, you know, all the intelligence uh, security uh, personnel will conduct, again, screening, bio down, you know, name check, name check, information, all that, which is a very extreme vetting process. So, in order to make to the U.S. as a refugee, it takes almost, you know, 10 to 10, even more, more than 10 years. You know, the least people who will get it's like 6 to 10 years. So it's a long process, you know, with extreme training. And all that time you live in the refugee camp. And then once you are approved, you will be sent to do again a medical checkup. Again, that's another security checkups. It's part of your process. If you are found sick, you can automatically go. You'll be, you know, put in, you know, an isolation facility where you'll be treated. You know, it will again. It's a lot of time. It could take another year or two. Again, to be approved medically. I was glad I was not sick. I was approved for medically, and then I was contacted by the immigration uh, organization IOM, and then that's how I boarded the plane. Again, do I know where I'm going? I do not know. Do I know where I'm waiting? I do not know. Do I know where I will be staying? I do not know. I have a map. I'm cooking in New Mexico. I don't know where it's located. I know it's the U.S. So I boarded the plane with no family, with no other person. I was glad and lucky that I was able to speak English. But just in case those who cannot speak English or communicate to English, I met a caseworker at Albuquerque Airport who had my name, Isa, Isa, said, here I am. I don't know who he is. Is he going to, you know, do something to me? You know, I don't know. So I jumped in the car with him with my luggage. I didn't know where I was going. He drove me. I kept asking him, how far are we going? You know, you know, it was around 40 miles where he was, the apartments that he was taking me. He told me, don't worry, I'll take you where there's some Somalis, you'll be happy. I said, okay, sir, where are we going, you know? You keep asking him because you are in fear, you know, you do not know where you're going. It's like you are now being taken to Somalia and someone will put you in a car and you don't know where you're going. They are trustworthy people, they are kind of people, the humanity, they are with, uh, they were from a uh, Catholic charity. 
The process is, you know, is smooth, though it's long, and people here welcome, you know, nicely. So I, I knew that I was, my life was not in jeopardized, but I was still not in fear, you know. I do not know where I'm going. So he last me to meet an apartment, and he took me to another Somalian guy who was from Kuwait. The guy was not able to speak Somali. He was only speaking Arabic and English. And good enough, I was able to uh, speak English. So he told me, this is your roommate. You know, this is your food. For until tomorrow morning, I'll come pick you up to process your documents, you know. OK, I said. And then he told me, this is your, you know, your mattress, this is your room. And then again, at that night, I couldn't sleep because I do not know who this person is. It's like, you know, where's the bathroom, you know, can I, I can't even eat, you know, stressed, you know. And then, you know, he came to me, he said, don't be afraid, you know, I was the same, I was shot the same way you are. I am your other fellow Somalis, you know, this is the United States. You're in a peace nation right now, people are so helpful here. So we can't trust everyone. So he kind of made me, you know, a little bit confident. I was, you know, I was at least able to sleep around three o'clock, <coughs> and I came around eleven o'clock. So I was up all night. So yeah, then in the morning I went, you know, to the Catholic Charity Office. I was able to be given orientation about the roads and the transportation and the system and you know the jobs and the duties and all that. I was able to, uh, people normally, uh, when uh, a lot of my friends uh, in Vera ask me, you guys get assistance all the time, you get the food share, you get the money from the government, and that's not reality, that is not true. As a refugee in this nation, we are, I am blessed, and uh, God, God bless America, this is a great nation that we are lucky to be here. The United Nation, the, the United States government, you know, is, is amazing government. You know, that's why we give the loyalty. We give loyalty to, you know, to the United States when we are when we are given to the oath of, you know, of citizenship, when we take the citizenship. So the only assistance we get as a refugee is one to two months. After the two month ends, you have to find your way of life. So people think that we're here and we are just taking the, the food, we are just getting money, cash. No. The longest assistance is given are the family household, and that's six months. A mother with children, if there's a husband or a man there, they have to keep going, they have to go to work. When I, you know, in two weeks, in Albuquerque, I told the agency I made it to work. There, there were other Somalis who were in the area, in Albuquerque City, who were three months, who were two months, and they told me, you have three months. Uh, to you know, to know where you are supposed to get, you will get your rent paid for two months or three months. I said yes, I know my rent's paid, but this is not going to last. I need to go for it. That's why I came to this nation, and I need to help my wife and child who are in Uganda refugee because I came by myself. I had to leave my wife and uh, child. I, I, I had no choice. I had to come because they were with my wife was with her family member, and. Uh, after I married her, I couldn't automatically say she's my wife and go with me. That's not how the process works. She has to go under the process, another very her own. So, so I immediately started working. I was taking three buses, three buses to go to my work. And another three buses, it's like an hour or two hours that will take me to get to my work and then come back. It's like three hours for me, you know, to put all that time to get to work and then come back because I do not have Car, and I did not have a choice, and I did not want to stay on the welfare of the, the small assistance that I was given. And I wanted to be a good, uh, you know, uh, good residence or good refugee by that time, and uh, you know, pay taxes. So I started working there for, uh, I worked there for one month, and then with the transportation, it was a bigger city, and I was not able to drive, I didn't have my permit. I called, uh, I called some of my friends who were in Wisconsin, I asked them where they are, where do you live? They told me that we live in Wisconsin. <laughs> where is it? Is it cold? Is it snow? <laughs> <laughs> Man, it is very cold and you are welcome. <laughs> it was June. Imagine uh, coming from summertime from New Mexico, coming to, you know, it was like still, you know, summer. 
But just wait until the, the you know the snow comes. I started following out like three jackets. I still feel cold. You know, I, I have the mentality and shocking of that the cold is gonna come through me. I was putting a lot of ladies, people will laugh at me, would say that, man, you don't need all this stuff to be out. You, know? you are just and you'll be fine, you know. So uh, and then uh, moved out and we came to bed. He helped me, you know, I stayed with him. I got a job, uh, you know. Uh, I came on Saturday, and I got the job application from January to Crystal on Sunday, and filled out the same day. And I was called for an interview the following morning on Monday. So I was interviewed, the gentleman who interviewed me told me that, hey, you have a lot of experience, you worked with the UN, you worked through the US refugee program. You, you, are you sure you want to work at the Turkey store? I said, yes. I said, I am here to work, that's it. I don't care what the work is, I need to work. So they took me a tour in the plant on the floor. Where, oh. You know, you will hear a lot of sound of the of all the equipments, and it was a little bit chilly. I was like, why is it cold in here? Because I just, they told me this is the weather you will be in if you are going to work here. This is the condition. I said, okay, I will need more jackets. The guy now, you know, I was taking you know around to the uh, in the plant. I've seen be, uh, people carrying meats, you know, the 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 poultry processing and all that. The took processing, and then they showed me, and then after the tour, I was going back to the office. And they asked me, Isaac, are you ready for that job? I said, yes, I am ready for that job. OK, the guy had to check to me. And then he told me, OK, I will call you in one to two days. You will do all your job orientation, then you will be to go. And then after I left, and uh, the same day, I was three o'clock, the human resource gentleman called me, saying, Isaac, this is Dave from HR, Jane Are you ready to take the job? I said, sir, I already told you, I need the job. He loved me and said, okay, so like, that. see me tomorrow morning, you will do orientation. And then on Wednesday morning, I did orientation. In the afternoon, I was on the floor. I was able to do the processing. Uh, I started the work. And then uh, I worked at January Turkish store until, for one year, until September. I started end of August and then worked until 2014, uh, around yeah, September 2014 when I left. And then the reason why I left, I started schooling at UW Bayern County. I had my degree and I was told, man, you have to put this aside. Uh, not the school told me that, but I Googled and asked a lot of my friends. They told me, well, you have the degree, yes. You can just jump a job here. You can't just be a social worker or an interpreter here. You have to do some, you have to refresh your English. You have to go to some extra classes. I started <laughs> UW classes. I took. I signed up for four classes, 12 grades, I remember. So, you know, it was tough because of, you know, a lot of, you know, writings, a little bit different than English, you know, I mean, a little bit different than African schooling. But I was, I was glad that there was some help and touring. I was able to, you know, work with, uh, you know, uh, some uh, English teachers here at ESL. They had some program called English 109 program that will help people who are, you know, have some struggle with English or who are new to the uh, to the nation. I was able to make my classes, and then while I was at school, I started volunteering and helping schools for parent teacher conferences. I one day I went with parents, uh, met with ESL teacher called Kim Fresen, and said, Kim, uh, I am uh, Isaac. I worked with the community there in Uganda. I worked with the UN. I'm oriented, willing to work and help this community. She told me, what do you have for any diplomas? I said, these are my degrees and my papers that I worked with the international organizations. She told me, yeah, you know what? Let me get your stuff. She took a copy of them. She contacted me. I said, Isa, can you help? I said, yeah, I could help. Then she conferences, you know, when uh, an aide is gone, I would sub. You know, while I was schooling, I was subbing. And then after that, I ended up being hired uh, within the 2014 by the school. The school found me that I was, you know, I was, you know, showing up on time. I was willing to, you know, to be there. I was willing to help, you know, the community. I was hired by the Bay Area School District in uh, in 2014, and then kept working. And then I was given a full-time job. And then after I worked a full-time job for one year. And then Jenny took us to open up a position in the Human Resources Department. 
And then I applied the human resource job. And then I wanted to leave the school. The school told me just to be a part time and you can go in the afternoon shift. <laughs> you know, the school retained me and I got two jobs now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I was, my, my, my second job at Junior would start two o'clock. But in the morning, I would do part time until 1 30 at school. So I got two jobs there. So I started working, became active, and then after that, school said, Isaac, the school needs you more than anyone else. We need to change your position. And, you know, I was instructional, bilateral instructional aid by that time for the schools, where I would go into classes and help students and communicate with the teacher, uh, teachers and, and parents. And then the school gave me a position which, which is which I am currently on, it's called Somali District Liaison, where I would run all the schools. So I would serve all the schools, Amina, uh, you know, Woodland Elementary School, uh, Review Middle School, and Bear High School. So, and then I left Chenyo to Christor after a year and a half, a few research job, came back to the school because I liked the, the, the school job, and then, you know, ended up working and volunteering with the community, helping the police, the sheriff's department, I was not paid, it was not paid, it was all volunteer. I would be called at the middle of the night, you know, sometimes I would help when the FBI would come for outreach to meet with the with the imams, with the masks, you know. I was I became the to-go person for the Somali community. I would, you know, working with the schools, I would teach the teachers cultural classes of East African cultures, or about Islam, about the Somali or Muslim students. And then I also did some presentations at, you know. Uh, you know, uh, UW, through UW uh, Extension, helping uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Barron, Wisconsin, uh, public, everyone who lives in Barron would attend. It was called uh, 101, 101 and Somali Cultural Class. It was open to everyone. It was organized by the Well Ministry of an organization uh, located in Barron, and UW Extension was partnering in Barron County Health and Human Services. So, I had a class of like more than this number, hundreds of people. So I would teach people about why do these people have hijab? Why do some people have some scarves on their head? You know, all those things. So I became an educator and a preacher for the community of Berlin and the, uh, the migrants and refugees of Somali, uh, you know, Somali citizens, citizens in Berlin. So when I came to Berlin, Berlin was kind of isolated. Our Somali community, Though there were some active uh, leaders in the, in, in, before me, there were some Somali active leaders in there, but they were no like you know they were not like you know opened up like I was. I don't want to place myself, but I was able to reach out to the communities. I have organized multiple worship leaders, church, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, fathers and imams. I have done a lot of gatherings where people could. You know, still talk, share ideas, and uh, share a meal. Because it doesn't mean you and I can be different. You can be white, I am black. You can be Christian, I be I could be a Muslim. But it doesn't mean we can still do only, we can't live together. We can't live, to, we can't work together. No, we can live together. We are neighbors. Everyone has the rights to believe or, you know, practice whatever you want. So I, my mission was to bring these people together. I have created multiple soccer programs after the school and during the summertime. I used Riverview Middle School. Uh, those of you who know better will know where Riverview Middle School is. I use the gym and I invite, you know, whether you're Caucasian, whether you're Somalians, whether you're Hispanic, everyone, they all come there, the high school, uh, you know, soccer boys who are practicing, I'll open the door and volunteer my time and they will come there, play together. And you know they will you know shake hands. So that has re that has really created a lot of programs. Yeah. And uh, I and the World Ministry, located in Berlin, have created an annual soccer program called Berlin Soccer Berlin Seven v Seven Soccer Challenge. Berlin Seven v Seven Soccer Challenge. That is uh, it was created in my apartment, <laughs> in my house, in my apartment, with two other guys, a Kenyan man called Otielo and a, a guy called Wade Copeland. He now moved out uh, of Wisconsin. You know, we all came together and said, what can we do to bring these people together? So this soccer uh, program became annual. It's in every August, every year, where all of them come together. 
and there are other tournaments that right now we have bigger little leagues called uh, Wisconsin Amateur League. It's uh, it's a big state league if you Google it. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman called uh, uh, Kaden from Hayward uh, is the organizer. But we have people coming from St. Croix Falls, Eau Claire, you know, uh, far away from you know all the northwestern uh, area. We all come together and play soccer. It's, it became annually. It's every year. The other one that I created is annually. And then the winter one is another program. So all these programs have brought people together. In addition to that, I am the ESL teacher at uh, uh, Kim Frenzen. At Bear High School, have created more uh, cultural events. The first cultural event that was ever had was in 2017 that I and uh, the, the teacher created. We say we need something that we need to do something that everyone can be involved. We brought all the people together. We shared the dancing. We have shared different music. We have shared different foods. You know, Chinese, Norwegians. I say, I don't care if you're white or not. I need every food. I said, if you're Scandinavian, I, I need your food to be seen there. So Norwegian food was seen. Swedish food was, was seen. So everyone brought their own food, and we shared the meal. That became also annual even until the COVID came, but then we couldn't do it. So that we stopped in 2018 because we planned on 19 and then COVID-19 came. We couldn't do it because we used to do it in uh, March every year towards the end of the school year. So those are the programs I created in Berlin, Wisconsin, you know, to educate people about refugees. You know, who are refugees, who are migrants? The great nation of the United States is a land of immigrants. I believe you may have come before me, your ancestors may have come before me, but this is a nation of abjurity, and I am a U.S. citizen, like any one of you who is on this uh, room today. And I am a proud U.S. citizen. That is, the, that is my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my goal, and I tell everyone, including my children, I always tell them, you belong here. You belong here like any other person. You know, you are black, that is fine. He is white or she is white, that's fine. This is a great nation where there is no one religion it says you, can, you have to only believe this religion. It's a nation of freedom where everyone can live, move, live, speak, and move freely. And uh, you know, I always tell my, my, my children, I say, we live in Wisconsin right now, we can move to the Mexico border in the United States. This is one nation. So I am glad, you know, I was able to come to the United States and I wanted to give back to the United States. And that's the end of my story. That's what made me run for a city council. And I started running for, uh, though I was still not, you know, I started, I, I thought when I started helping the police and the city as a volunteer, I couldn't run. I wanted to run earlier when I came. I checked the constitution and the books, they told me you have to be a US citizen. Well, when you come as a US citizen, when you come as a refugee in the United States, you get what's called I-94. It's a temporary uh, document that you will be allowed to work for one year. And then after one year, you're eligible to, work, to get a green card. The green card is a resident card that allows you to stay, for, uh, stay and work in the United States for 10 years. And you could still travel too, but you have to request what's called a travel document. So, and then I had my green card that I said, hey, I am a resident, this is the United States card. What's wrong with, what's wrong with this card? They told me, no, you have to be a citizen. I Googled and searched a lot, they told me, yes, you must be a citizen. And then I started, you know, helping the community, you know, bringing people together. And then lastly, on November 15th of 2018, is when I took the oath of ceremony to be a United States citizen. And it was a big day for me and for my family. So uh, that day, it was a big day for me. The day I got my citizenship in November, and I turned in my nomination paper on December. Wow. <laughs> so I couldn't wait until that time. And I knew I had the chance at least to be one day on the seat. It didn't mean that I just wanted to be on the seat, but to represent, to represent Baird as a whole and my community as a voice. So I started running 2019. There was an open seat 
we when I another Somali guy called Faisal and another uh, guy called Paul Soli, who is a local from there, and then I was able to make the primary. I and Paul Soli went to the final spinning election. I was defeated. That was okay. That allowed me to be, uh, the mayor appointed me for the uh, Berlin City Creation Council to work on the parks and, you know, help uh, to build a Berlin uh, beautiful place. I was on that. And then, again, I also ran. It was just an open seat and I was told to turn in my uh, application. It was a county board seat, my district. I turned in my application. Again, I was not selected. Another gentleman was selected. Again, I was appointed Safety and Traffic Commission, a community representative, Safety and Traffic Commission for uh, the county board, uh, Mr. Oki in Berry County. So I was in the, uh, that committee uh, for the county and then I was in the city. So I was still not elected, but I was still involved. I was still volunteering, you know, and I was still able to help. While I was on the frontier, I was part of uh, building uh, Anderson Park. We have a beautiful park uh, in Berlin right now. It was open uh, two years ago, and I was in the ceremony there. I contributed over two thousand dollars through my community, and uh, we we took that check to uh, the Kwanz to help to contribute because we live there. And we need to be there, you know, in our culture. We there's a problem that says that if people people who live there do not have one eye. It's good also you don't have one eye. Mm -hmm. That's an example saying that yet you, you have to move the people who live there. It doesn't mean that you need to move your eye, but it is, you know, a, a problem that says that be with the people who you are with. You know, live, you know, with them and, you know, put your hands out there. So very Somali community have done a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, assistance towards other community. We have contributed, you know, uh, uh, thousands of money to the the Chittag tornado, I think it was in 2017, if I remember right. So, you know, during Jerry Close, it was hard time for all of us. We have fed over 200 uh, uh, law enforcement who were doing, you know, investigation, the DOJ department, the FBI. So we were working with them. I was there as a translator interpreting, you know, for investigation because at that time I was still helping at January Turkey So we are, we were, you know, we are like an Arab Americans. I always tell my, you know, people. You may see sometimes people who have some hatreds. It doesn't mean we don't have some people in our community. It doesn't mean all the Americans are that way. I know when someone acts different, I know the way they act because they don't, doesn't mean that they can do anything or they can, you know, take away what you have, but only that it is what it is and you have to go forward. So our community was welcomed, the Bering community, the Bering County community, and we are, so amazed how that community now interacts each other, you know, gets, you know, uh, plays together. You know, if you can see now, if you go up here in Anderson Park right now, you will see a lot of mixed people together. We have seen intermarriages in there. So uh, coming back to my uh, story, then, you know, after involving that, and then I again ran in 2020 again. Guess what, who I ran with? My friend who I was working with, Chief Bayer, Bayer Police Department. He served over, I think, 30 years. Someone told me, you think you're gonna be the, the chief of Bayer Police Department? You know what I say? Well, I didn't call each other because I worked with him, you know, uh, on the uh, on issues that we have in our community. And he was a good friend of mine. You know, I told him, you know what, Bayer? I turned in the uh, the nomination paper before you, but I didn't want you know I didn't want to I didn't mean I didn't want to you know challenge you because I know you, but I said good luck and good luck you know this is a freedom of nation. It doesn't mean that he bribes me or bribe I bribe you. That's why I like United States of you know in America. In other nations now, you will see people running for offices for you know giving out money which is not, you know, uh, uh, the right thing to do. Because people have the right to put their votes where they want to go. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrats, but I care whether your votes are. That is the time that I went to my community and said, we need to vote. And you need to know the importance of voting. 
In the United States, the only way we can change is to vote. So, I have been talking to my people and telling them, before I ran, I had a lot of candidates, no matter, where, no matter whether they were Republicans or Democrats, I was helping them. I knocked doors with them. You know, I say, it's good to vote, you know. I will, I will interpret to them, ask him what's he going to do for them. You want to vote for him? Ask him, <laughs> ask questions, you know. I can't just take you and ask you to vote. You have to vote who you think is going to do good for them or for your community or for your family. You know, when we vote, we are making a decision of not only you, but other people surrounding you, whether it's your county or your city. So my people have started learning to vote after I was defeated two times. You know what happened the last time I started taking my signatures? A lot of them told me, this time, you know you don't have enough votes. Why run? You are. They told me, how much money are you going to get? I said, you know what? There's no money. It's a local government. Maybe there's a gas money. It could be hundreds, two hundreds, but there's no money. Some of them will ask me, then why are you running? You're helping your community. I told them, I want you and your children to know that we can be on the table. Yes, I am helping the community. I, can, I still do the work, though I was still defeated. But I want to be a role model for you and your children that they are eligible, as long as they are not criminal, that they're eligible and still represent the community that they live in. So, so whenever I would run, the kids at school would ask me, did you win? Did you win? Because they wouldn't know when the election is on, you know. I would always say, no, we're still waiting the results, you know. It's still, the prior election began, you know. So I started educating the community, calling people, you know, at the mass. I would tell them how to vote. You know, with COVID situation, it was so challenging. You know, a lot of people don't want to go. You know, line up for a long line and vote. I say, that is what's called, what's in here? Uh, absentee ballot. I say, there is absentee ballot. And I can take it from A to Z. So I was working with uh, uh, a group of voter organization in Bergen County. I don't know what the organization name is. Yes, Bergen County voters. Yeah, so they showed me and trained me how to do, you know, progress absentee ballot. And I have trained college students, and I have told them, you know, you can have your parents, whoever wanted, you know, could ask, you know, a friend or anyone to, to question their ballot, you know. I know it was challenging during COVID-19, so people have known that they can vote while they're at home, and that was so nice. A lot of people say, well, you know what, during the winter, I don't want to go and vote, uh, drive and uh, put my gas on and vote if you're not getting, if you're not getting a lot of money, this is not like, Congress, it's like, so well, you're tired. You know, why do you have to go, you know, all these apartments and upstairs and run around the city of Berlin and ask people for food? You know, I, I told them my mission is not for money. My mission is to represent this community and to educate my community to be like any other Americans. The first time I ran, when NBR interviewed me, I have seen a lot of nasty comments. That didn't stop me. And I knew that I would make a dream. And my dream came on April 5th, when the city clerk called me and said that, it's our congratulations, you are the next Berlin City Council. <laughs> so that's where my story ends, you know, you can, you are open, the floor is open for questions, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Yes, may I ask? This is more of a comment, that I will never forget what the Somali community did for me in Barron when I ran for Congress. Oh, the Somali you. community had signs in all of their businesses. They mar I only had 10 shirts that said vote for Mary. Yeah. Somalis <laughs> marched with me in the parade, donated money to my campaign, you, and the get out and vote, the get out and vote was all I heard among the Somali community, and I say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when you were 
Who is going to reach out to me and I was part of that campaign for you? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, Kim, um, you mentioned the teacher, Kim. Kim she came here and spoke one time um, and about, about what was going on in the schools and was very supportive. And one of the things she talked about is, and, and you alluded to this, um, a kind of a community coming together that was before COVID. Yes. Uh, where people were um, trying to celebrate getting to know one another. Yes. And is that going to happen again? Because I, yeah. I'm hoping it does. We are hoping that's the events that I talked and I was the co-creator uh, of that. So the, the first event, the time I was with over, over 500 people. Use wow. the microphone. Oh, the first time I was with over 500 people, six, 700 yeah. people showed up. You know what? With COVID being really, uh, you know, leaving right now, we may have again. Hopefully, like we let's all hope that COVID disappears, you know, and then the world opens up. So we are hoping that was annually, annually designed, mm -hmm. and we are hoping it will still happen. Yes. Okay, because I I think we'd like to know, because some of us might like to go. Yeah, and, you know, I have a contact right yeah. now. You know, yeah. I have a contact with Anne. I have another question too. Yeah. Um, you used to have two restaurants that were on the main street there. I said yes. And yes, one yes. time, you and I went up and had a, a meal there. It was a, an interesting experience. And I wish there were a re there was a restaurant that was available so that people could go and experience your cuisine and your and and try some of the food, but. There isn't a, there, last time we went up there, you, there wasn't a restaurant. Yeah, well, there's still one restaurant open. Use the mic, mic. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. There is still one restaurant open. One closed because, uh, because of uh, lack of uh, enough uh, customers and uh, the rent was so expensive for the business person to okay. deal with it. It was a big restaurant. That was the biggest restaurant that closed. The lady who was running there, you know, couldn't, you know, afford, you know, the rent and the expenses. But we still have the one, uh, you know, restaurant where you could test in Somali food. The sambuchas, the rice, the pasta, you know, the Italian pasta. Yeah, still, we still have one restaurant open. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, you could still come if you come if you are, you know, going through Highway Eight. You know, you are welcome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm just wondering how long you were here before your wife and child came over. Great question that I left out, right? <laughs> so, I came June 5th, 2013. My wife and my son joined me. April 19, 2016. So almost three years, you know, yeah, I would say three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a long process. I had to I had to do a lot of, you know, uh, paperwork, a lot of interviews. Yeah. Yes. Isaac, how many of the Somalis are citizens now? Like what, half of them or more or less? For right now, majority of them are U.S. citizens. Oh. Yes, majority of them are U.S. citizens. And I, whenever they get a citizenship, I always tell them, check in the bucket of the U.S. CIS. CIS. There is one letter that says registration, and that's that's my target one. If they, I would either do with them on paper and pencil, and they turn into the city. If they don't, I would just do it online registration, because a lot of our community do not are not able to communicate English wise, so it's hard for them to register and vote the same day. So we help them register, and then the voting day is a little bit easier for them to vote. How long does it generally take to become a citizen? You must be a U.S. You must live and work and be a good citizen. I mean, good residence and persevere for five years. And then after the five years, it's one year additional for the interview process. For the one year is interview process. So probably approximately six years, I would say. Sometimes. Again, you know what? Some people will even take it eight years, seven years, some people even ten years. 
sometimes you know screening and vetting again will take the process you know so yes and where did you go for your citizenship test so you know the uscis the homeland security they check your nearest address of where you are they need the nearest address to their field office so it is St. Paul in the office. Office is where we are supposed to go. We can't go to Milwaukee. Yes, we live in Wisconsin, it's federal office. They normally put your case right away there. You file and you send the application with a fee. You have to pay 725 uh, and children the same way, you have to pay some money. So, and then you have to pass the civic question. Some of you may know, like, I, you know, Mary have to, will know the citizenship test. You know, you have to go through the test. We teach students at the high school, so they are ready and prepared when they take the citizenship test. No matter whether you speak English or Somali, you have to pass that 100 question. So, so our, our families and the community starts the, uh, the program around uh, prior to one year of the interview in order for them to learn the 100 questions. Uh, when I was doing my interview, a colleague of mine asked me, Isa, where are you going to get your citizenship? I told her, you know what? I have to do a lot of steps in order to get, what do you have to do to get that? She, I said, I have to do an application, pay the fees, and then prepare for 100 civic questions to answer. Reading, writing, and civic question, and the US history too. So it's a combination of one hundred. It's one hundred questions, a combination of all the all those that I mentioned. And I asked her. I said, if I ask you one of these questions, you may not even be able to ask. You know, to ask. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Spanish war, French war. You know, it's not easy. So she said, he said, you know what? I have no clue what you are talking about. <laughs> so it is true. You know, you know, it would be nice if every citizen could take this question. You know, yeah, it would be an experience for them too. And we'll know more about their country. Yes. When you first came to the United States, did you come directly to Wisconsin or did you, for example, Mexico. go to Fort McCoy or something similar no. to that? Like, uh, Mexico. Mexico. No, that is, I can quickly, you know, explain that. There are three ways. Yes, I came through and quickly. When you are a refugee, it doesn't mean you are at the border. You are a refugee from another nation, far away from the U.S. Your process starts from the U.N., the U.N. Refugee Agency. You live in a refugee camp where you are given food and assistance by United Nations through the U.S. government assistance. You do multiple interviews, paperwork, fingerprint, investigations, multiple fittings. Then, after that, you will do a medical checkup. After successfully you pass the interview, medical checkup. Then, you will be given, you know, I-94, a temporary visa that will only allow you to come to U.S. that you cannot return. So that is how refugees are processed. They will be, they are an organization is called IOM, International Organization for Immigration. It's implemented by UNHCR. Uh, it's a UN uh, organization right now, but before it used to be separate. So I used to work with them as a transfer integrator. So I am familiar with the process. So that is refugee. Asylum, if you hear someone come from through US Mexico border, it's asylum. Means they walked multiple and uh, thousands of miles and they come to the border. They will be arrested, detained. They will be put in jail, interviewed. And they will they will have a prosecution story. <coughs> well, if they are eligible, they will be released and given an I-94. The same thing I was given, but the process is different. They came illegally, but they will be accepted once they are interviewed. I don't know human should not be illegal. I don't want to say that, but you know that's how the system is met. That's how the system of immigration says. Like, why did you come here? Who are you? You know, and in another way, it's it's a good thing to make sure that you are assured that you are safe, you are safe and are good to this nation. So it's another way of the United States government that deals with people. And then for Fort McCoy and the Ukrainians, 
The difference is fourth Moko is, you know, they were US allies. They were translators, interpreters, and they were given a priority after that clash of, you know, uh, you know, uh, capture of Taliban happened. They were immediately assisted by the US government. They were transported from Afghan to US with US armed force, armed force blade. Not a civilian. They came with the US armed forces. And they are based in not only Fort McCoy, but all around the US in a military base. It doesn't mean they are released and go to the United States. They will still do the same process that I did in the military camp or Fort McCoy, wherever they are. Some of them may be rejected because they have some different ideology. It doesn't mean they're in the US. They could still be deported. So that's the difference. So I came through, uh, when I came to US, I came to Albuquerque, stayed for two months, left and then came to Bahrain, and then never moved since I came. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you. Yes. I just want to comment. Uh, we had a, a student that uh, took the test. Uh, she was from Mexico, and uh, we tried to take the test, and we couldn't answer a lot of questions. <laughs> questions. I mean, there were questions, and I, I worry sometimes that uh, our students aren't learning civics. Nope. You know, they're really not uh, being taught civics in a very, uh, and, and taught the whole issue of citizenship. And, uh, and I, I wish that would, we would put some emphasis on yeah, that. Yeah, so our students with the ESL program, they have that test that they take within where, where they're at the school. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for them to learn as, as a class. They will take as a class and then they will, when they do the interview, it will be easy. But for parents and the adults, yeah. mine is very hard. It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. You will study a whole book of the US Constitution, <laughs> part of the US Constitution. You know, World War One, World War Two. you know, you know, who was Benjamin, you know, a lot of, you know, tough questions. But it is somehow like good to know that the country you are going to claim as a citizen, to know their history, to know their language, so it's important to know. Any other question? So I want to invite you for one event that's coming at UW Eau Claire. It's UW Barron County, but it's now UW Eau Claire. We have an event called World Refugee Day. It is June 20. I think the time is, can one of you remind me the time? Is it six or five or seven? I, I don't have that information with me. I'm yeah, sorry. I can. It is. I, we can circulate it maybe if you have the information. I, I can, can send you. I can forward the email, email to you. Yeah. It is that day. It's around, I'm assuming, four, five o'clock, four o'clock. But I will double check the time and send you a flyer so that you can, you know, distribute that flyer. So we have, uh, you know, an organization called, uh, not an organization, but, you know, a group. I am part of that group. It's called uh, Ben County uh, Advocacy Group. Uh, immigrant advocacy group. So we have uh, a quite number of Somali families who have uh, family separation issues that they left their children in Uganda, or Kenya, they're here, they're US citizens, and with uh, Trump travel ban, with uh, COVID, everything added up and they couldn't get their children. You know, they did the DNA test, they are the children, they have checked, they have, you know, uh, paid all the fees and, you know, decision processing but still they couldn't come with COVID and everything is getting complicated. So with World Refugee Day, uh, they, there will be a documentary. Uh, Syrian and Afghan documentaries will be watched at the university. So it will be nice you know, if you can join us and be supportive of me. Thank you so much for inviting me. Just want to, um, we'll close with a nice thank you, and we certainly learned a lot. And the League of Women Voters, if you ever need any help there in Barron County, I know you have voter services down there. We have a very active voter service group who also goes into the high schools. So they've got a really nice program when 
seniors that are about to turn 18, they go in you know, twice a year and help students register to vote um, and know the importance. Do we have the same message as you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. At this point, um, we will just adjourn our annual meeting and thank you all for coming. And it was certainly um, quite a journey and an interesting story that we all heard. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. I